From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Ahead today from Oklahoma State University, Daryl Peel is featured on this week's cattle market segment. He'll go over the numbers from the USDA's Cattle on Feed and Cattle Inventory Reports released last Friday afternoon. Then K-State's Justin Wagner will look at the growth performance of early weaned beef calves. Based on K-State research, which demonstrated that when managed correctly, early weaned calves are capable of utilizing dry feeds at a high feed-to-gain conversion rate. And on this week's 4-H segment, K-State's Tara Markley and 4-H volunteer Nancy Bergdahl will discuss a community grant program that helped local youth gain a better understanding of career opportunities in agriculture. Plus more here on Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome to Agriculture Today, coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University. However, for our cattle market segment this week, we turn to a livestock economist out of Oklahoma State University from his office in Stillwater, Daryl Peel. Daryl, we have a raft of new numbers to talk about, the USDA's cattle on feed report for this month and the mid-year cattle inventory report, and we'll dive into all that in just a moment. Last week's trade, though, seemingly very difficult to get a read on it because uh, there was something of a stalemate between uh, packers and feedlots, for one thing. That's exactly right. You know, we've had, you know, a lot of pushing and shoving the last week or two to try to establish some sort of uh, summertime trend for this market. Uh, You know, I think we've got the opposing forces here in the sense that we've had lower box beef prices, so packers are feeling some pressure to tighten up a little bit on their purchasing side, at least the prices they can, uh, they're interested in paying. At the same time, we've seen a relative tightening of feedlot supplies here in the very short run. Um, And so feedlots have, uh, you know, we did push the market higher uh, two or three weeks ago, and feedlots are trying to uh, capitalize on that and extend that a little bit here again in this midsummer period. Reportedly, there was a trickle of business, maybe a dollar or two dollars higher, but very ill-defined last week. And what we'll give would be the question, and that's pretty hard to determine at this point. Well, that's exactly right. I, you know, we've had two weeks of relatively uh, minimal amounts of trade. Something's going to have to give pretty soon, but it is really difficult to sort of see who uh, who blinks first in this uh, situation. So I think we just have to kind of wait and see. Looks a little bit like box beef has, uh, you know, sort of uh, stabilized here at these uh, summer lows. Uh, and actually, they, you know, they've they've held together relatively well. Of course, uh, packers are probably uh, working on forward pricing this meat. So we'll. See see what gives this week. You know, again, we, we've got uh, opposing forces, but uh, relatively balanced at the moment. It's very difficult to say which way it'll go. And just a moment here on boxed beef. As you say, the summer lows hopefully are in, and one shouldn't get too anxious about the lower boxed beef prices. This is a typical seasonal trend, isn't it? I, it really is. Uh, you know, this midsummer doldrums, I call it, uh, here, we're kind of between, uh, um, you know, 4th of July on the one hand and, and Labor Day being uh, the next uh, sort of big uh, grilling holiday coming up. And so we're kind of in the middle of that, and, and uh, we've had a lot of hot weather, which uh, does kind of slow down uh, midsummer demand for beef. So, uh, you know, for all of those reasons, it's not surprising that we've seen a little lull in this market, but at the same time, you know, not a major concern at this point. Are you reading anything of interest out of the feeder cattle auctions of late? Again, here we see spotty trade and rather irregular flow of cattle, but uh, what are you seeing, if anything, there, Daryl? 
Well, it is very spotty at this point. Uh, this is not a time of year when we tend to see uh, you know big sustained runs, so it's going to be a little bit more variable. I think, by and large, the market uh, for feeder cattle has held up pretty well. You know, again, in some regions, we are getting some indications that dry conditions may be uh, moving some summer cattle a little bit earlier than usual. Uh, but all in all, I think these uh, feeder cattle prices have held up pretty well. Uh, they're really only slightly below where they were this time last year, despite the fact that you know. Overall, we're in a larger cattle inventory and supply situation. So uh, I think these markets have held up uh, remarkably good so far this year. So what do you think is underpinning the market, the feeder market, that is, at this point? Well, you know, feedlot demand appears to have been pretty good. Uh, you know, we've had decent placements, uh, slightly larger in this latest cattle on feed report. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, cheaper grain prices, which is uh, is helping to support that feedlot demand for feeder cattle. So I, th- I think those factors, uh, you know, and, and just the generally uh, uh, robust performance of cattle and beef markets across the board is continuing to help support these feeder markets. We want to get into the details of that cattle on feed report shortly, but you mentioned this. We do see calves coming off of summer grass early in a number of locations, certainly here in Kansas, where pastures are pretty well spent because of the drought in a number of areas. Are there any near or long-term implications of this early movement of those calves off of grass? Well, we, you know, when we see these kinds of, uh, you know, sort of unplanned movements of cattle, it does change the timing of things. Uh, we look at these placement patterns in the most recent cattle on feed report, as well as the previous month, uh, we see larger numbers of lightweight cattle placed. And so we can think down the road to how that will affect the timing. It changes that. Obviously, it doesn't change the overall numbers. It's the same number of cattle. It's more a question of when rather than how many cattle are, are out there uh, and when they're going to come to town. And so, you know, the, the drought conditions, I think, have not had uh, in total uh, huge impacts, obviously in certain regions a little bit more severe. And I think they've been very short-term in nature in terms of just changing the uh, the timing of these uh, feeder cattle marketings that would have happened anyway within a matter of a, a few weeks at most uh, to, to move them up just a little bit. Mm-hmm. So to all the USDA numbers that uh, were released on Friday with that cattle on feed report, we did see higher placements. That was anticipated, right? You know, this report was extremely well anticipated. Uh, you could almost take the pre-report estimates, and that was, uh, it, depending on which list you look at, and, and the average of those was very close to where the report came out. So placements came out you know, slightly above last year, about 1.3%. Marketings were just fractionally less than 1%, to almost 1% above a year ago. And, and it's important to keep in mind that June this year had one less business day compared to a year ago, so uh, that changes uh, the total amounts uh, or the implications on a daily basis a little bit. The on-feed inventory for July 1 came in at uh, you know 11.3 million head that's up 4.3%. Uh, we've been holding that kind of 4% year-over-year uh, level for the last uh, three months or so after being quite a bit higher than that early in the year. So really nothing to get all excited about when you think about these numbers. The trade once more pegged the report pretty well ahead of the game. I don't anticipate the market to react in a short-run sense to this. There were really no surprises in this report. And, and again, it just confirms, uh, you know, the long-term situation that we've been in for quite a few months now and continue to be in, and that is that we generally have more cattle out there. But we're working our way through them. And, and, you know, another way to look at this is that feedlots over the last several months have done a pretty good job of moving these cattle through the feedlot and through the system uh, relatively timely and and staying ahead of things. Uh, And so we've avoided what you know could have made a uh, challenging situation even worse if you start backing up these cattle. We haven't seen that yet, and there's no real indication at this point that we will see that. The cattle inventory report, the mid-year account from the USDA, also posted on Friday. And Historically speaking, it's a pretty big number, isn't it? It is, you know, again, it confirms that we have, you know, we have been in expansion for several years. That continues in 2018. So we see an all cattle inventory that's up 1% year over year for July 1. Uh, The beef cow herd was up uh, also about 1%, just under 1% on a year over year basis. Uh, The dairy sector, pretty stable with no change in uh, milk cows or uh, dairy replacement heifers. But the beef replacement heifers were actually down about 2% this year. And again, 
again, that's an indication that while we're still uh, seeing larger numbers here in 2018, we may be coming to the end of that as we move into 2019 and seeing uh, perhaps a, a cyclical peak in these cattle inventories. So what does that portend for the market as we look, say, for the remainder of 2018 into 19? Does this lend more stability overall to the trade? Well, I think it means that we have a little bit less supply pressure. We're going to continue to see, again, uh, bigger supplies of cattle, and that translates ultimately into bigger beef production. The estimated feeder supply, if you use those other inventory categories and back that out, uh, would suggest about a half a percent year-over-year increase in feeder cattle supplies as of July 1. And the estimated 2018 uh, calf crop is up uh, nearly 2%, 1.9%. Again, that follows from the herd increase we saw a year ago. Those calves are hitting the ground this year, and that means we're going to continue to see larger feeder cattle supplies, you know, all the way through 2019 at least, depending on what we do going forward here with the overall herd inventory. Something that's to be monitored, but again, not an earth-shattering set of numbers here, Daryl. No, it seems like we're sort of winding down expansion. We're approaching a, a peak and, and expanding slower. Uh, and again, probably, uh, unless something changes here in the next 6 to 12 months, uh, we may be approaching a peak in these numbers. So uh, there's still some supply challenges that, that take a few more months to work through the system, but they're relatively less than we've been through. And again, given that we've done a relatively good job of handling bigger supplies over the last uh, 18 months or so, um, we can get through this uh, with even a a little bit less uh, pressure as we go forward. All right. Well, any parting thoughts on the likely trade trend this week? Once again, the Fed cattle market was somewhat slow to come around last week. Uh, We're going to see more of that this week. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't continue to struggle here for another week or two uh, to, to establish some uh, direction in this market. Uh, once we get into August, um, you know, pretty early in August, then we'll start seeing uh, buying for Labor Day weekend, and that'll probably uh, provide a little bit more uh, direction in this market as we go forward. But uh, again, we're in the summer doldrums now, so we probably have a couple more weeks of uh, hot weather uh, market impacts to uh, work our way through here. Well, we'll slug our way through it, and we always appreciate Appreciate your comments, Daryl. Many thanks to you. You bet, anytime. He's Daryl Peel out of Oklahoma State University, livestock economist there, and he joins us regularly to talk cattle markets here on Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Next for you on Agriculture Today, input on managing early weaned beef calves and whether or not one can keep their performance up to norm as they're taken off the cow early. And this is something that has arisen again this summer with dry conditions in a number of sections around Kansas and producers looking at early weaning as a way to get the cow herd through those conditions. We're talking now with a beef systems specialist, K-State Research. Search and Extension, based in southwest Kansas, Justin Wagner. Justin, you just put an article out on the performance of early weaned calves. It's in the Beef Tips newsletter out of K-State. You've talked with producers who are considering, if they haven't done it already, weaning calves early for a variety of reasons. That's correct, Eric. Really, this article you know, addresses what I would say is one of the more common questions that we get when we visit with producers about an early weaning program is, you know, just simply, are we going to to be able to maintain the the level of performance on that calf that we're seeing on the cow if we go ahead and wean that calf uh, and do something else with him, whether that's put him in a dry lot or or try to background him on some additional forages and and maybe some supplements. That very question was the subject of a study conducted at K-State's Agricultural Research Center at Hayes not all that long ago, and it did shed some light on that issue of maintaining performance of these calves. 
It did, and and you know, early weaning is something that that we've been working on with the faculty at the Ag Experiment Station in Hayes on several different occasions. Just you know, how do we manage those calves better, and, and really trying to maybe understand the process a little bit and, and what a producer can expect. Our objective was was to look at uh, limit feeding those calves and and essentially program feeding, if if you will, those calves to three different target levels of gain, uh, one pound a day, two pounds a day, and, and three pounds a day. Um, now, right at the, the surface, one of the things I want to acknowledge is that three pound a day average daily gain on an early wean calf, that's that's a pretty lofty goal. And we knew that coming into it, but that's that's our job is to, to try to push the system there a little bit. And one of the things that, that we learned was, you know, just how well these calves can perform. And I, and I think that it really surprises a lot of people. And one of the things that I like to say is if you're looking at an early weaning program, really our goal should be can we maintain or get the same level of performance that we would have got with that cow on grass. I, I think we have to have that, that base level of performance really to make it work. And you were attaining those very numbers, at least in the instances where you targeted a pound a day, average daily gain, and two pounds per day, right? That's correct. You know, if we look at, you know, a lot of times if, if someone asks me, well, what would I, what are calves gaining on grass with their with their dams? And I would say, you know, somewhere between 1.5 and two pounds a day is, is a pretty good number. But really what I think is exciting about that early weaning story is not so much the average daily gain but the ability that these lightweight calves have to convert feed resources into gain. Across the board, in, across even this study and a, and a couple of others that I'm aware of, it's not uncommon for us to see feed conversions on early wean calves, you know, 120 days of age, probably with an average weight of, of 400 pounds, that have the ability in a dry lot setting to convert feed at, at four pounds a a feed to produce a pound of gain. So it's an exceptionally good feed conversion. I, I think that's that's really exciting. A big part of that is just simply due to that calf at that point in his growth curve is it's very linear um, if we look at it, so that they can utilize those feed resources you know very effectively. In this study, anyway, what specific rations were used to uh, convert these calves over to a dry feed? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question, Eric. So from a general sense, you know, we can use a variety of different commodities to build a ration for an early wean calf. You know, and, and those rations could range from some sort of a starter pellet with some forage to a, to a total mix ration. In our studies, we utilize a total mix ration. Our ingredients actually may change from year to year or study to study, but one of the things that we do in, in those rations we always have them at a very similar nutrient composition. Uh, we know that the, the intakes of those calves are going to be relatively low when they come on feed and we wean them off the cow. A lot of times they're going to be at 1% of body weight or, or sometimes even less. And so what that means is we've got to have a very nutrient-dense diet to put in front of those calves. So typically if we look at our, our nutrient values, on a dry matter basis, we're going to be feeding a ration that's going to be at least 16% protein. It's going to have at least 0.75 megacals of NEM per pound and probably have an NEG value of somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.45 to 0.5 megacals per pound of NEG in that ration. Now that's, you know, that, that is a very dense ration, uh, but that's really if we look at those calves that are eating less than 2% of their body weight, we need to have a fairly nutrient dense ration to do that. And, and so that's, we may shift our ingredients, they may change, but we always keep those nutrient composition specs the same. And really, when we do that, we're formulating for a calf that's going to consume about 2% of their body weight in dry feed per day, maybe 2.2. And hopefully, we're going to target an average daily gain of somewhere between 2 and 2.25 pounds a day. So you might say, you know, we used to talk about the rule of two a 2% body weight dry intake, and, and we want to gain two pounds a day. I actually kind of feel like that that rule has probably changed to a rule of 2.2, a 2.2% dry matter intake by seven days on feed, and, and a 2.2 average daily gain, hopefully during the first 14 to, 
to 15 days on feed is would kind of be my ideal target as we put those programs together. Of course, Justin, all of this is contingent upon that transition that is bunk breaking those calves and getting them used to a dry feed consumption. And uh, there are certain things that producers can do to assure that that transition happens as rapidly as possible and as smoothly as possible. Absolutely. You know, I, I frame it as anything we can do to make that calf's transition going to be easier. We need to heavily consider that. If we're going to be putting those calves up in a dry lot, uh, one of the things I want to do uh, first out of the gate is if I know what ration I'm going to be feeding them or I'm going to use a commercial starter pellet, I might want to drop a little bit of that feed to those calves while they're with their, their dams on grass. Simply being, just give them a little bit of exposure to that feed. That's one of the best things that I think we can do. It doesn't have to be done every day. We don't even have to deliver a lot of feed. That's the fact that we get those calves some exposure that maybe we put it in a similar type feed bunk that we're going to use in the dry lot. I don't think that's necessary, but, you know, all of those things can help them ease that transition. The other bigger mistake that I see on not just early wean calves, but just newly arrived calves or calves, you know, normal wean calves, is a lot of times we bring them into our dry lot situation. Those calves the first day, they're pretty hungry. You know, they may eat pretty well. Maybe they come up the second day and we put a little bit more feed in front of them and we get a little bit ahead of those calves. And then from that point on, we really struggle to get intake in those calves. So I think there is something to be said for keeping those calves when they come into the facility, keeping them a little bit aggressive. Coming from a research protocol standpoint on the studies that we've done, we typically start our calves at a, a half a percent of body weight of dry feed and a half a percent of some sort of palatable hay that they would have seen previously. So good quality grass hay. Um, And then we'll, in a stepwise fashion, just begin to increase the amount of ration that those calves will receive. And so really trying to step the intakes up pretty slowly, keep the calves aggressive, and keep them coming to the bunk. Once more, the research that K-State has carried out has proven that the gains of these early wean calves can be equitable to leaving them on the cow until what we would call the normal weaning period. There is the factor of management, though. Uh, This program requires a little higher level of that, uh, but it pays off, Justin. That seems to be the case anyway. Well, I think so. I mean, we can't, you know, dispute the fact that we are trading some management. Um, however, you know, given the circumstances of, of being dry, so that's one really good place to early wean calves. You know, there's some other scenarios that come up as well that oftentimes we don't think of. And, you know, that's maybe first calf heifers that are a little bit thin, you know, mm-hmm. really bringing those in, maybe considering an early weaning program on those. So I think there are some other areas, but it does require more management. Facilities can be an issue as well. I would contend that if we're committed to early weaning and that's the option, we can make a variety of facilities work. Mm. Um, We just really kind of need to know the limitations with what you're dealing with. And so it's really, you know, all about a cost benefit, if you will. You know, what are the other options that are in front of us? And, you know, what can we do to get us forward on those calves until we're ready to, to market them? Well, producers, if you'd like to see the key data from this research that we've been citing right here, it is included in this article in the Beef Tips newsletter out of K-State on the performance of early weaned calves. Go to ksubeef.org and download there the July edition of that newsletter. Justin, thanks for letting us know what we know about this particular topic and how to succeed with early weaning and maintaining those gains on those calves. We appreciate your time. Thanks again, Eric. Justin Wagner with us, Beef Systems Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. We'll return shortly with more on this Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
We're back now on Agriculture Today from Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here as we take on today's agricultural news headlines now, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, White House Trade Advisor Peter Navarro last week said that the economic impact of the U.S.-China trade situation is, in his words, a rounding error when compared to the overall U.S. and China economies. He said President Trump is looking at the broader chessboard with regard to that trade strategy. He said it's much less disruptive than the headlines would suggest, and it's much more constructive, as we see, in his words, the adjustments made in terms of where investment is going to go and where we're going to build. He shared those thoughts during an interview on CNBC. Those comments came as the Fed's Beige Book released last week uh, that businesses in all 12 Federal Reserve districts noted impacts from the tariff trade actions. Meantime, Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa was quick to respond to Navarro's comments, saying that, quoting her, America's farmers are caught in the crosshairs of this game of chess. She went on to say again in her words, offhand comments like the ones that Mr. Navarro made disregard the people whose livelihoods depend on global trade. She said in Iowa alone, more than 456,000 jobs are supported by trade, and these new tariffs are threatening $977 million in state exports. In Ernst's words, that is no rounding error. Candidate nominations for this year's Farm Service Agency County Committee elections will soon be due at your local FSA offices. Here's more on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. A reminder to those eligible farm producers considering themselves or another producer for nomination for USDA Farm Service Agency County Committees. The FSA County Committee nomination period closes on August 1st. FSA Acting Deputy Administrator Brad Carmen says one-third of county committee seats nationwide is annually up for election. Nomination forms can be dropped off at or mailed to local Farm Service Agency offices by no later than August 1st. The committee itself is responsible for fair and equitable administration of FSA farm programs. They make local decisions affecting local producers, so it's important that we have local input on this process. Carmen, as producers will be mailed their 2018 county committee election ballots beginning November 5th, and will have until December 3rd to have their ballots postmarked and mailed back to the local FSA office or to deliver them to the office personally. Winning candidates will be sworn into office on January 1st. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. We do want to take this opportunity to let you know more about the series of KLA K-State Ranch Management Field Days that are upcoming in the weeks ahead, co-sponsored by the Kansas Livestock Association and Kansas State University, of course. Enhancing the genetics of a commercial cow herd, removing invasive trees, and improving stock water accessibility are all topics on the agenda for the August 6th KLA K-State Ranch Management Field Day. This is set for near Medicine Lodge. It'll be hosted by the C.J. and Russell Blue operation on the Nichols Ranch which they lease. C.J. Blue will share their experiences with retaining ownership of their calves, collecting sire testing data, and utilizing DNA testing for genetic selection. And Russell Blue will provide insight on the new cattle handling facilities built especially for AI at the ranch headquarters. There will also be a look at a plan to uh, develop multi-year grazing and stock water, and that will be conducted by Russell Blue and from the NRCS Range Management Specialist Dusty Taha. They will talk about how that plan was implemented on the ranch and discuss future projects that will help improve and sustain the Jip Hills grasslands there. And NRCS soil conservation technician Carl Jarbo will be on hand to explain how new stock water sources were developed and strategically located on this ranch. In addition, AgReview's Amy Roeder and Steve Volrath will share timely information about programs provided to livestock producers through the USDA's Risk Management Agency. The August 6th field day will begin with registration at 3 o'clock. It'll conclude with a free beef dinner at 6.45 that evening. Again, that'll be on the Nichols Ranch near Medicine Lodge. And Remington Ranch near Quinter will host the August 13th field day. Loma Land and Cattle Company of Lacine will be the site of the final field day on August the 16th. For information on all of these KLA K-State Ranch Management Field Days, go to www.kla.org. 
Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of Tree Tales. And standing by with that is K-State Forester Bob Atchison. Bob? A study by the U.S. Forest Service National Woodland Owner Survey estimates that there are 123,000 Kansans that own a total of 2.1 million acres of woodlands. The majority of these woodlands occur in small patches that are 40 acres or less and often are not thought of as contributing to the value of farming operations. Most Kansas farmers do not think of themselves as woodland owners, and often these areas of the farm are the last to receive any attention. However, well-managed woodlands will contribute to the overall economic value of a farming operation and provide a place for our children and our grandchildren to experience wildlife, the beauty of the natural world, and many other benefits. Managing woodlands in Kansas can be confusing. Where do the trees belong? How can they increase the economic value of a farming operation? The Kansas Forest Service at Kansas State University is available to meet with Kansas farmers to help answer these important questions and connect farmers with farmers who have improved the value of their operations through woodland management. The Kansas Tree Farm Program, the Kansas Forestry Association, the Walnut Council, and Kansas Christmas Tree Growers are all important groups that can help you diversify income and increase the value of the overall farm. Some of the practices these groups engage in include timber harvest, establishing pecan, black walnut, and Christmas tree plantations, removing invasive trees and plants, planting trees beside streams to stabilize stream banks, renovating old shelter belts and planting new ones to improve crop yields and reduce windblown soil. Whatever your interests may be, the Kansas Forest Service is here to help you improve the value of your farm by managing woodlands and shelter belts. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service inviting you to get in touch with us today by calling 785-532-3300 or check us out on the web at www.kansasforest.org. You've been listening to another Tree Tale. Thanks, Bob. Well, Jeff Wickman is standing by with this week's 4-H segment. You'll hear about a special initiative to introduce urban youth to agricultural career opportunities. That's next, here on Agriculture Today. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. Fifteen youth from suburban Johnson County have been exploring potential careers through a national program called Science Matters, created by Bayer and National 4-H. The program's community-based grants brought 4-H leaders like Nancy Bergdahl, a teacher and Johnson County 4-H volunteer, and Bayer employees together to foster young people's interest in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM. Johnson County Extension Director Tara Markley says the grant funded a trip for the youth, some 4-H members and some not, to participate in a National Youth Summit on Agri-Science in Washington, D.C. this past January. A little bit of prep happened beforehand is that we identified three different groups. We did a whole long process with them of identifying a community need issue that they were excited about and would like to think about and work on that was ag and science related. One group wanted to look at food insecurity and what that looked like within Johnson County. One of them wanted to focus on water conservation, and another one wanted to focus on animals and really focusing on zoonotic diseases. So we had a slight framework when we went to D.C. Once we were back in town, the food insecurity group started focusing on food deserts, and Nancy can talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but focusing on insecurity, food deserts, and container gardening. The water conservation group really wanted to talk about education and how to come up with some water conservation educational toolkits for third to fifth graders. And then the zoonotic disease group 
they really focus on creating educational pieces around what is zoonotic diseases, and they focus half on livestock and half on domestic animals, everything from ferrets and rabbits to cattle, and they had one on amphibians. Each group did a showcase event where they did an educational component within the community around those action items. Two of the three groups really worked on surveys. They did pre-surveys to really find out what the public's knowledge was. And then we had our final showcase event where they presented to their peers and to their families, and we actually brought in folks from the local bear facility to hear what they did and how they did it. Another culminating event at the end was that the youth got to go to the Shawnee plant and actually tour, so they got to put on lab coats and go in and see what was happening at the actual facilities. It was pretty intense, and this was all outside of their normal schoolwork and 4-H work, so we worked with the kids to really say, how could this relate back to your schoolwork and what you're doing? It was a time commitment, for sure. Nancy, could you go into a little bit more detail about what you did in terms of the food insecurity project? Sure. There were six of the 15 kids on the food insecurity side of it. Two kids did research on food insecurity, food desert, mapping, researching any issue that's happening in Johnson County with that. Two other kids kind of focused on container gardening because they thought they wanted to get healthy food, healthy vegetables to those in need. And then two of the other kids wanted to teach nutrition education and what that meant in the community. The kids all decided when they were in Washington, D.C., when they were working on their poster sessions, that they really wanted to work with elderly people that were in need. And so between the Extension Service and Mission Southside, we got a list of names and places where we could kind of help out. And there was one location that ended up being right in the heart of the food desert, the map that Charlie found and created. They started doing surveys. And just so you know, these six kids that were on my team are actually from six very different locations in Johnson County. I had Spring Hill. I had one from DeSoto, one from West Lenexa, one from East Lenexa, one from Overland Park, and one from Olathe. They ended up having 120-some people do the survey. It gave them information about what people know about the needs of food insecurity in the county, how they thought they could solve that problem, and nutrition education-wise, what should be taught. And so the kids then took that survey. They met with a master gardener to figure out how they could plant vegetables, how they could teach that. And so we ended up at a facility in Olathe. It was a 55 and over senior living facility. And they had two raised beds that they allowed us to plant many different vegetables, broccoli, peas, radishes, spinach, lettuce. And the kids took them from the very beginning process of that, planting teaching them nutrition education, and also having them do the survey about food insecurity in the county. We actually just finished that program here recently. The kids have been going over there after the initial planting and meeting with the residents, and they have since used up all of those vegetables. So it really was a very successful situation, but it took a lot of hard work, a lot of planning. Gardening is not an easy thing to do, and they learned that. So I think this was a total success. What about the students? What did they take away from this? What were some of their reactions? Well, they they loved being with the residents. And I think that was the big part of this was the relationship building that I saw happening. But you also saw that they gained maybe a better understanding of how science and technology can fit into the agricultural area? Absolutely. And I can speak not only as a volunteer, but my son, Charlie, was on the team and he wanted to do this because of the science. He doesn't have much experience with agriculture. And he came away from this project being super excited about opportunities that are out there that he didn't have any idea until he went to this Agri Summit conference. And I would reiterate that there were several youth. One of the reflection questions at the end showcase event was, what did you gain from this experience? And so many of them said, I'd never thought of agriculture this way before. And I was just sitting there thinking, what a success, you know, because we didn't plan. I didn't plan for them to, you know, we were intentional about what we were doing in this process. But for them to actually identify, I'd never thought about agriculture in this way, was a huge success and a milestone. And so just really all those opportunities that those youth would not have gotten had we not been a part of this grant was amazing. 
That's Johnson County Extension Director Tara Markley. A second year of the grant program has been approved, and they're finalizing details on how to move forward. Nancy Bergdahl is a volunteer who has been working with youth as part of the grant to increase interest in agriculture and science. Now here's a rundown of county fairs being held over the next 7 to 10 days. The Hamilton County Fair in Syracuse, Haskell County Fair in Sublette, Labette County Fair in Oswego, and Miami County Fair in Paola all continue through Saturday. The Morris County Fair in Council Grove runs through the 30th, and the Meade County Fair continues through Friday in Meade. County fairs that open multi-day runs this week include Geary, Jackson, Donovan, Russell, Norton, Stevens, Thomas, Marion, Cherokee, Cloud, Leavenworth, Trigo, Finney, Kingman, Lincoln, Mitchell, Ness, Pawnee, Pratt, Wichita, Coffee, Wilson, Chautauqua, Wallace, Barber, Shawnee, Allen, Riley, Chase, Greenwood, McPherson, Nemaha, Phillips, Wabunsee, Butler, and Sherman. A complete list of county fairs and run dates can be found online at kansas4h.org under the What's Hot heading. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.